Hello and welcome to this short presentation which is intended to introduce the report Bioformulations 2020 which is published by IHS Markets Agribusiness Intelligence. My name is Jim Bullock and my colleague David Calvert and I are the authors of this report. Now just a short word to start with on iFormulate. David and I founded the company in 2012 and we're a consultancy specialising in the science, technology and commercialisation of formulation. We are active in all industries which make use of formulation technology and we have undertaken many assignments from clients in the agrochemical area. For agribusiness intelligence we have previously authored reports on formulation as well as sustainability in agrochemicals. Now the report we are talking about today, Bioformulations 2020, that's already available and at the end you'll find details of how to order that and there'll be a revised edition of the general agrochemical formulations report arriving later this year 2020. Over on the right hand side here you'll see the chapter listing for the report and now I will hand you over to David to tell you about chapter one. Thanks, Jim, for that introduction. And as with all reports of these types, you need to start in the first chapter with some definitions and some basic understanding of the terminology. So in terms of bioformulations, probably the first one that people think about is yeah, biopesticides. And this term has been used quite a lot and continues to be used. So what does that term mean? Well, in the report, we will touch on first what definitions there are available. And the EPA has probably the um, most conclusive definition. I'm not saying it's the correct definition, but they have a conclusive definition for what biopesticides is. And they divide them up into three types. They talk about biochemical pesticides. And those are in essence pheromones or materials that attract a pest away from the, the plant um, or the crop. They then talk about microbial pesticides, which are microorganisms, and we'll focus a lot on those and probably what people think of most of all when they talk about biopesticides. So those will be bacteria, fungi, virus or protozoa. Um, and they are very specific to the pest. And that is certainly one of the advantages of biopesticides. Uh, it also means that sometimes they struggle to cover a wider number of pests. And the third one that the EPA defines is plant incorporated protectants, which are pesticidal substances, they say, that plants produce from genetic material that's been added to the plant. Um, those pips um, maybe are a little bit unusual and not what people think of as biopesticides, but that's in their definition. When we wrote the report, we did a search in November 2018 and there were 366 active ingredients registered as biopesticides by the EPA. And there were 32 of these plant incorporated protective active ingredients registered by the EPA. Um, that was an increase on 2016 in April when the EPA themselves stated there were 299 registered biopesticide active ingredients. So that shows that there is a growth certainly via the EPA registration process. What does it look like in the EU? Well, it's less clear cut. And of course, the EU, even though it is meant to be one market, each country does sometimes go its own way, certainly on on issues such as this. Um, and there is no real clarity necessarily. And this is causing distinct problems um, for organisations and for producers of biopesticides to try to get them registered. And we look at the registration process. I was at a, a conference in 2019. Um, organized by the um, International Biocontrol Manufacturers Association and a lot of it talked about how they were lobbying to try to get a simplified, which is a challenge, um, but a common registration process across the world. So we discussed that in the first chapter. Uh, we then talk about how we would look at the different classes of biopesticides. In essence, a little bit like the EPA, we talk about microbials, we talk about biochemical extracts. We talk about macrobials, so larger, uh, in, in essence, insects or um, nematodes. And then we look at others and those that are classed in the same definition. So that first chapter is looking a lot at biopesticides and some of the definitions and registration process. 
We don't forget about biostimulants and, and there is an aim by um, many organisations to get some definition for biostimulants. There is one around. Uh, we talk about plant growth regulators, sometimes called PGR, and some of the definitions that are around for those. We talk about what is there in the EU and they have something called low risk plant protection products and they have a simplified registration process. Um, but I'm afraid that when you start to look at those uh, types of products, then there are, there are very few actually registered within the EU. Uh, and uh, a search that we did showed that there were, let me just check, there were um, 13 actives in December 2018, which was up from 11 in December 2017, but that's not not really going to make a major market. But we do go through those and talk about what the advantages are and the types of um, products that are in that list. But the main reason why you might want to buy this report and, and, um, and actually read it and has commercial value is to look at some of the market growth protect projections. Um, so this is something from Dunham Trimmer. If you're aware of this market, you'll know that they look at and produce some very good figures. Uh, and they looked at the market growth from 2014 in terms of sales up to 2020. And you can see the growth in biopesticides here down from uh, 2 billion, up from 2 billion in 2014 to uh, almost doubling in value in 2020. And compare that to macroorganisms, you can see that the big growth as organized by Dunham Trimmer is in that area. Um, so that's the chapter one introduction and now I'm going to hand you back to Jim who's going to take you through chapter two and chapter three and I'll come back to you and talk about the fourth chapter. Thanks David. So in chapter two we describe the main categories of active ingredients for biopesticides and other bioag products and their features in more detail. We also describe here the most important features of these active ingredients which formulators need to consider when designing their formulations. Stability is particularly critical to most bioactives which can be sensitive to degradation by co-formulants and to other actives or to ultraviolet light. Actives can also be sensitive to temperature variation during manufacture, storage and use. And during processing they can also be sensitive to mechanical action such as high shear or grinding. Now, living organisms will proliferate if the water activity in a formulation is above a critical value or remain inactive but alive if the water activity is below this critical value. And in general, in formulation, in the container, that's where you want to be. If the water activity is above the critical value and organisms proliferate on storage of the, the product in the container before use, then those organisms can quickly use up any nutrients and will die out. And that's not what you want. But once they've been applied to the crop, they may need to reproduce quickly. So the nutrients actually may be useful in the formulation to help them reproduce quickly after application. In chapter three, we cover the technical basics relating to the many different formulation types which formulators can choose from. Formulation can be used to maximize product stability. It can be used to reduce the active ingredient dose which is needed in the product and to optimize the biological activity of the product. It can be used to optimize handling, application and convenience of the product, to improve safety to both the user and the environment. And of course, it can give you competitive advantage by giving advantageous properties which can be of commercial value in the market. Now in this chapter we'll be running through the various types of co-formulant used as well as considering the factors which formulators have to take into account before they choose a formulation type such as the properties of the active ingredient, the application chosen, handling, packaging and shelf life and so on. Now I'll hand back to David again to take a look at the formulation of microbial actives. Thanks, Jim. And in, in chapter four, we really get into some meat about how people do formulate various products in this market. Uh, and we start with a big one, which is microbials. Now, as with um, all formulation, you need to understand what your active ingredient is. So we discuss the properties of microbials and how some of them are very relevant in terms of the formulation approaches that are taken. 
we review the formulation types that are used to formulate microbials and look at how those may change um, in the future uh, and why those types have been used. We could not do a chapter on the formulation of microbials without looking at um, Bacillus thuringiensis or BT as people talk about most of the time. Uh, so we go in and look at how that is formulated and some of the issues that have been resolved by formulation and some of those that still remain. We then can't ignore other bacteria, so we look at some of the main bacteria that are formulated and how they are formulated and what the issues are. We have to cover fungi, of course, so we cover a wide range of types of microbials and viruses, um, although it's fair to say that there is not too many viruses around at the moment. But what is there, uh, we look at and we consider the aspects that could cause issues with viruses. And finally, we look at microbial inoculants. Just wanted to give you a taster of some of the data that's in there. So, so this is when we looked at, at microbials and we looked at the percentages of different liquid formulations that were around. And what we saw was that 64% of those that we found were formulated as an SC or as a suspension concentrate. We then had 20% as a soluble liquid, 5% um, as an EC, and, and why only 5%? Well, obviously, living organisms struggle to survive in an EC, and then there were some others. But it's interesting that it really is dominated by suspension concentrates uh, with then a little bit of soluble liquids, but it's mainly suspension concentrates in microbials. So in the chapter, we continue then to uh, actually look into detail at some of the formulation approaches taken for microbials. Um, we look at how they may resolve issues, and one of the issues that is common for these uh, types of materials is UV stability, so how long they last in the field. And we look at how formulation can help to resolve that and how it has been done. We do, as in all chapters when we're looking at these, a patent review and see what's been patented, whether that's been taken commercially and, and some of the issues that may be around that. And we look at commercial activity and look at the types of companies that are involved and give you a, a, a long list of the companies that are active in delivering microbials to this market. And I just wanted to give you an example of the type of formulations that you can find in patents. Uh, and this comes from an FMC patent around BT, and they just gave what they called were standard SC formulations. And you'll see um, that really they include common ingredients that you would expect in actually a standard SC formulation. The active uh, thickener, some dispersants, antifoams, some preservatives, antifreeze, and water as a diluent. They gave two. Uh, we could debate whether ammonium sulfate is, is actually an antifreeze, but that's what they, they put into their patent and how they described it. But you'll see here the thickener, interestingly, isn't the usual um, xanthan gum that we see with conventional ones, although that is used with microbials, but they use a clay atapulgite, which is a, a delivered as an aqueous suspension and then typical type of surfactants as dispersants. So that's the type of thing that we give you in chapter four. And now once again, I'm gonna hand you back to Jim. He'll take you through the next chapters. In chapter five, we take a look at how related biochemical materials such as proteins, peptides, and enzymes are formulated. Now there's a range of sophistication in these actives ranging from relatively simple hydrolyzed proteins used as biostimulants through to some newer specially selected and targeted high-tech peptides. Formulation of another new high-tech category of RNAi, RNA interference actives, has also been included in this chapter. We took a look at publications and research activity. Publications are emerging in this area of formulation from research institutes. Uh, the patent activity is dominated by smaller companies, by academics and research institutes, while the commercial activity in this area appears to be spread across larger and smaller companies. And here are a couple of those examples of patents as a sign of where innovation can be directed. In the first example, the actives are immobilized to stabilize them using a porous foam matrix, and then nitro, a natural chitosan is deposited to stabilize the actives. 
in the second example, and we've already mentioned RNAi actives, here's an example of how these rather unstable actives can be stabilized and formulated by adsorbing onto layered double hydroxide materials. And that helps to improve the stability and the longer term efficacy of the product. In chapter six, we take a look at other natural extracts which can be used as bioactives. These can be extracted from plants and microorganisms and occasionally from animals and can be water soluble or oil soluble. And that property actually helps decide the formulation type which is chosen. Natural extracts are often mixtures and are often poorly characterized. This is challenging for the formulator who requires predictability and consistency very often in the active. Again here, publications in this area come mainly from research institutes and patents have been filed by a mixture of companies, academics and research institutes. Both larger and smaller companies are commercially active in this area. And here are some examples again of patent activity in this area. There is a long series of patents from Eden Research on microencapsulation of nitro natural actives such as terpenes using natural yeast cells as capsules. These capsules are porous and previously these pores have had to be partially blocked by molecules in order to control the release rate of the active ingredient. In this example, however, new capsules of around 500 microns in diameter were developed and these new capsules do not require the use of these so-called payload trapping molecules to control the release rate. In the second example we've provided uh, here, uh, this institute uh, showed how innovative encapsulation has been attempted for a very common bioactive neem oil. Uh, so first of all, a nano emulsion was made by mixing neem oil with a non-ionic surfactant. Then a biopolymer solution is made separately in an organic solvent by biopolymer we need mean something like gelatin, chitosan, alginate and so on. On mixing the two phases the solvent diffuses into the aqueous phase it's a it's a water soluble solvent and that then causes the biopolymer to come out of solution and deposit at the oil water interface to form colloidal suspensions of biopolymer nanoparticles which encapsulate the active ingredient. Now we're going to move back to David for chapter seven. Thanks, Jim. So in chapter seven, we try and do a catch all and try and cover other bio ingredients that maybe we haven't covered in the previous chapter. So the rather inventive title of formulation of other bio ingredients. We start by defining what we mean by these other bio ingredients. And, and the first one we looked at is formulation of insects and mites. And to be fair, you may say, well, how are they formulated? And, and we did find some, some literature uh, and some patterns about the, t the ways that you can add things to the insects and mites that actually just allows them to be delivered alive and healthy to the grower. So there is a formulation element in there. We look then and, and the majority about how you might formulate nematodes and how they are actually formulated uh, in commercial products and what the literature has said about delivering nematodes. Some of those are fairly conventional approaches, some of them involve encapsulation and, and we talk about alginates and how alginates can be used to encapsulate nematodes. We then talk and there is a lot of work going on about how you might for, how you do formulate them with insect cadavers. So that's the dead bodies of insects and, and in essence they're, they're hiding them and giving them a refuge. Uh, but how you do that and, and the way that you can formulate that is quite an interesting one. And, and I have to be honest, rather surprising when I looked into it into some detail. We then conclude with pheromones and, and we said in chapter one that, that pheromones were a part of the first part of the uh, EPA definition of biopesticides. So we look at how they are formulated and, and the main issue um, that is that is solved, I guess, or resolved with, with formulation is the uh, continued release. So the sustained release of pheromones. The issue is you don't want to put up a pheromone trap and it all be released within the first few hours and within the first days. So formulation, as with other 
uh, formulated products, you can do delayed release. And we talk about how that's done with pheromones. And as with everything, we do discuss some of the commercial activity and, and talk about some of the companies that are active in this area. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to, to Jim, who actually in chapter eight will talk a lot more about the commercial activity of suppliers. Thanks, David. Now, in chapter eight, we look at the companies involved in bioformulation. We've divided these into a number of categories that you see here. First of all, the major producers of conventional synthetic agrochemicals are active, and they've certainly begun to diversify into biocontrol and other biological products. Some formulation activities have been made public, but of course, not all of them. And all of these companies, however, have considerable formulation expertise already to meet the challenges of biological products in the future. So we think they're likely to consolidate and grow their position in biological product formulation. Now, the smaller companies and the biocontrol biostimulant specialists were certainly the early adopters in the biological market and these companies remain significant today. The patents and publications coming from these companies point out the need for formulation in innovation. However, if you look at the market itself, most of the formulations currently on the market are conventional and straightforward, relatively speaking. Now, we do think that innovation will be needed in future. And the question is, will these smaller companies have the capability and capacity to innovate in formulation as the market develops? There's also a rather small a category of startups and technology providers. These tend to be single technology companies with a particular piece of active or formulation technology. These could be, for instance, acquisition targets for some of those other companies mentioned. Then we've got rather a big category of supply chain companies, and we divided these into contract manufacturers for formulations and suppliers of co-formulants. So the ingredients that go into formulations. Now, some of these appear to be active in biopesticides and biostimulant markets, but not all of them. And certainly most companies are not yet actively promoting their capabilities in this area. So now we're going to move back to David for the final chapter and to round off. Thanks again, Jim. So, yeah, in chapter nine, we uh, we look at where it might be going and, and the future direction of biopesticides are, are intrinsically linked really to the market. And some of them are very similar uh, to what you see in conventional pesticides. But we, we did in chapter one give you some data. And again, here on market growth, the reason where it is going to go, it's going to grow. And then once again, this is this is data from Dunn and Trimmer. Uh, but this time they, they looked at growth rates over different time periods and they looked at them in different geographies. So what we can see and, and the line is actually giving you an idea of the value. So in, in 2018, the largest value, as you can see, was in North America and then Europe uh, with uh, Latin America slightly behind that. But what you'll see is they were projecting actually annual growth rates in all regions, but the biggest growth rate they, they predicted would be in Latin America. And if that growth rate over to 2025 took place, um, I guess if we calculated that up, then we would see that it would probably be the largest market for biopesticides. And um, so we talk about that and that really, really drives, the drivers behind that growth uh, are discussed. Regulations, we've spoke about that, and that will definitely be a driver. Uh, be that regulations to help um, bioformulations or to actually hinder conventional active ingredients. Both of those will help. As with conventionals, um, there will be mixtures coming to the markets um, to help with resistance and um, maybe the industry might not like it, but there will be combinations of conventional and biocontrol agents that will help either will help with the IPM treatment, will help with resistance. And that will happen and that will become much more frequent. And we give some examples of that. What are the new opportunities for bio um, formulations? We talk about those. Um, there will be. And, and many of the co-formulants, inerts and adjuvants that are in bioformulations are coming from the conventional market. I, I think what we will see 
um, is an increase in specific co-formulants, inerts and adjuvants developed for this market. And um, you only have to see actually this year in 2020, you see um, some co-formulants um, being launched with a low carbon footprint um, and also being targeted as sustainable. So, so Croda have their new eco range, which is produced using renewable energy and using bioethanol um, to produce their surfactants. So that's a trend that we would expect to continue. And formulation technology will develop and people will, rather than just taking the formulation technology from conventional ones, they will start to develop new formulation technology and apply different formulation technology to solve some of the unique problems for bioformulations. And then we'll, we'll say what will be the commercial activity and, and will that be mergers and, and acquisitions and present some data on that. So that's it. That's our overview of what's in the report. Hope you found it informative. Um, the report was uh, is available from IHS Market. There are sample pages available for you there. Uh, you can follow that link. You can take some of the phone calls and somebody will be able to give you more information and uh, obviously some prices. So thank you very much. And from Jim and myself, goodbye.